everyone, and welcome to Perspectives. I'm Martina. This is Lisette, my lovely co-host. Um, we are back this um, this week or this video because for us it is a different week. We are back for part two with Dr. Dr. Uh, Mejia, and we're really just going to continue the discussion, really kind of pick up where we left off last week, and maybe talk about a few new things as well that we would like to pick pick Dr. Mejia's uh, brain about uh, as well. Uh, but before we get just kind of get into it, anything you want to say, Lisette? Yeah, no, I'll just say, I know uh, at the last episode, we, we touched a little bit on, you know, COVID and some of those, you know, issues and equity issues. And I think we're continuing those and, and having that conversation. Uh, and we touched a little bit on a sort of the, the migrant immigrant population. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that. So I think that might be just a great you know, place to start. Um, I know, Dr. Mejia, you work uh, it, within that population um, and, and sort of know a little bit more. Uh, me, myself, I come from parents that migrated and came uh, from Mexico. And, and a lot of the work that I do also involves uh, with, with that population. But, you know, I think that might just be a great place to, to start and, and, and really get into that conversation around, you know, what does what does healthcare look for our immigrant migrant population in the United States or even just here in Chicago uh, where we're all at? And then, you know, what, how can we achieve equity uh, across, you know, populations? But, but yeah, you know, Dr. Mia, any kind of initial thoughts around this? I know you probably have a lot to say around this, but just love to kind of let you kind of kick kickstart our, our conversation yeah. on this. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you again. And it is really a pleasure to, to really be part of this uh, conversation. You know, um, you know when, I, when I think about the, you know, when I, when I was coming to this country, I remember having this information, you know, I know I, I never been before in the city, but I know, you know, did, did a little research and I know that there was a lot of, uh, Latinx population and more or less how was the composition. So that that was that was in some way appealing, right, for me, because I know, you know, I was gonna be working with a lot of uh <clears throat> people, you know, uh from my same ethnicity. That was good. But you know what, beyond what is particular for for the Latinx population, I think it's interesting to see how some areas that really called my attention when I came initially. And I remember, you know, when I was doing my residency, I remember, you know, uh, I did a couple rounds of research. And I remember being part of, you know, some research initiatives with the Urban Health Institute, you know, associated with uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And I remember doing some studies around two areas. One was uh, what is called the Hispanic paradox. Yeah. And the other one was about the, you know, presence of the huge impact of diabetes among uh, Latin population. And I think those two areas really call my attention. Um, I quite frankly dedicated some time to read a little, a little bit what was available, right? Um, you know, I found interesting studies, you know, happening, especially in the South, Mm -hmm. cohorts of diabetics, huge cohorts, right? Yeah. In, in Texas and, you know, different things. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fascinating, right? It's fascinating to see, you know, what happened with the populations when they immigrate, right? What happened with the first generation? What happens to the second generation, right? Because it's, it's completely different, you know? And let me tell you, when I, when I have a patient in front of me who's from any country, you know, um, who's an immigrant, I can tell you very easy, you know, it's very easy for me to say this person was born here or came here being a child or just came here a month ago. Mm. Because it's a completely, I'm not, I'm not talking just about the language, it's about, you know, embracing the, embracing the culture and, you know, a lot of factors that you can see, you know. And the fascinating thing is how much that, you know, how huge is the impact in the health of the people, right? 
it, it's, it's huge, it's humongous. And, and regardless where are you coming from, you're affected by this, right? You're affected by the social, social conditions, you're affected by, you know, the no integration to the, you know, family living conditions, eating habits, you know, um, the quality of food, you know, when many of our people come from an environment, especially when they come from rural, rural areas, where they eat extremely healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Extremely yeah. natural, extremely organic, and they land in, in, in this territory of, you know, uh, high fructose corn syrup, right? Where everything is kind of uh, made by the food industry, which, you know, we, we know, you know, the, the effects. So those, those are interesting components. And when I think about, you know, the, the immense amount of patients that I've seen in more than a, the 16 years now, you know, it's, it's really interesting, you know, and how those factors, you know, modify the outcomes, right? And probably we, we mentioned before the dead gap, you know, and, you know, that concept itself, you know, which we mentioned before is completely unacceptable, has to see a lot with these social conditions, right? When people come here looking for a better future, for, you know, some steady income opportunities, but, you know, it depends of, you know, how, where you land, what is your, what is your, to who you dedicate your time, the education factor is so critical, right? And that will define your health outcomes, really. That will define in what group, I mean, how it's going to be your, your really, uh, even your life expectancy. So a lot of, lot of things that we can, we can discuss for sure, but, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating topic for sure. You mentioned sort of the, what you said, like the Hispanic paradox. Is there like a health difference between those that have maybe recently gotten here, just been here a short amount of time versus maybe people like my parents who have been here a long time, have gotten into the culture, have been here. And is there sort of a difference in the health? Because I'd love to kind of know what what sort of that means like because it sounds like if you're coming from a country right you just kind of got in here you come from a diet like you said it's very natural very organic sort of thing and then you get here and it's a completely different landscape what you have access to because you're just here you might not have you know the money or, or be in, in in an area where you have readily accessible you know fruits and vegetables and all these kind of organic things but I wonder if that's sort of what that is implying or talking about i think i don't know well let, 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 let's start by defining or not defining but you know for, for for everybody who's listening you know the hispanic paradox is this it's a question up really there is no evidence proving anything it's just a question mark you know mm -hmm. that you know early observations show that you know morbidity and mortality you know among immigrants not only hispanics any immigrants have the trend to be lower yeah. is the, the real reason you know is unknown right but some numbers and not, I'm, I'm talking about pre-covid right nothing is after covid because we know covid really impacted our population right uh in general immigrants and you know but before there were indicators that you know and there are many theories right many theories associated with this some people said uh, there is a cultural factor when people really rather go and spend the last time of your life with your Broken family table. or Logic with. You know, this is the problem when you have these uh, speakers that start speaking by themselves. Uh, I know, I have. I know, been. we've she had often does it. No. It's okay, go ahead. <laughs> She often will do it. I don't even want to say her name right now because I'm like, no. It'll yeah. trigger all of ours. It'll trigger all of them. <laughs> this is crazy, you know? I never asked this guy to start, you know, sending me. Well, anyway, that's funny. It's okay. It's part of, it's it's part of it happens to us. It's part that of the process. So, so, you know, so some people say it could be because people prefer to spend the last portion of your life over there you go and die with your family you know in, in your eye with your people you love you know and culturally this is huge for for latinx we 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 really regardless of the time you spend in this country people 
really want to spend the last time in your part of your life. So that could be one, one reason. Many people have said also when for immigrant populations is sometimes, you know, there's kind of a selection factor where people who dare to emigrate, you know, may have a healthier uh, status, more health is unknown. The question is there, but in my opinion, it's extremely interesting to know why, right? What, why, you know, in these early observations, again, pre-pandemic, you know, um, it could be under registers, it could be, right? The people with no insurance, for example, people undocumented are less linked to health services or social services. So data is not as reliable, you know, as for any regular citizen or regular resident. So that 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 part for me is extremely extreme. But that what, what, what really we see in the in practice is you know the lack of access, the lack of education, the fast food industry. Uh, that's real. That's that's absolutely real. I mean, the impact that that causes in, in our communities is absolutely real. It's undeniable, right? Um, and, and it's very sad because it starts very early, right? It starts in the, in the school systems, you know? The food that is provided in the schools is, is suboptimal. It's absolutely suboptimal. Um, as people grow, right, you know, the situation doesn't improve. You know, as, as, as health providers, we see, you know, fast food is, fast food is a real problem, right? Because it's, it's cheap, is convenient, right? You don't need to shop for groceries. You can eat in your car. And now they can take you to the door of your home, right? Um, it's so convenient. And let's be honest, it's even delicious, right? But it's, it's by far not healthy, right? And that's part of the, the, the big issues that we see is, you know, getting, you know, really the impact is closely linked to the lack of knowledge, uh, the lack of basic principles about nutrition. So again, a lot of social social influences in, in the health outcomes for, for people. You know, hearing, hearing you kind of go through all these different uh, real life things that you see, what would be something that you would either recommend or suggest, or you could uh, see how do we get the, uh, the immigrant population, I guess primarily the a Latinx community, is they are coming here from, from another country and they may not speak our language. How do we get access to make sure that they can get health care, that they can eat healthy food, and that they can afford it, which is often the thing too, and, and being able to access it. And I know that's a really big kind of broad question, but I would just love to hear some insight from you. I have opinions. I have by no means any uh, expert opinions because I'm not a public health person. But something that, you know, and it's not only for, for Latinx, it's in general for underserved population, and that include Black and Brown communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the most critical, critical aspects really is the education factor. Because the problem is, you know, it is the only really effective way to modi modify behaviors is the only way. Is when you really understand. If I don't get the concept, I don't get the real why it makes sense to, like, for example, eat healthy or eat more vegetables or you know avoid fast food or sugar sugary beverages. If I don't understand the principle, it's going to be very difficult for me to make the right decisions in terms of the food that I take or my family takes, right? And it's complicated, right? So I think from the public health perspective, I think that will be the step number one to, to start doing a, ch a change. It's really, really impacting education. Education. I, you know, there are, some, there are many initiatives. You can tax the beverages. You can, you know, control, even try to modify a little bit the, 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 the access to, to fast food. You can do all kinds of those things, right? You can restrict the access to tobacco, and that's very, very, you know, commendable and it's, it's good. But I think, you know, it's about people making conscious decisions, decisions that can really make the difference. It's not about, you know, the other way. It's not about, you know, 
forcing in some way people because we know that you know at the end of the day it's a personal decision it's a personal decision and you know it's funny because i have patients who say <laughs> i have my i have patients who are they are funny sometimes they say you know that to me i don't have the power i don't have willpower i can't right so i i really i try but this is this is the way i've been you know eating for my entire life so i mean when you tell me you tell me to, to each vegetables and grains and stuff like that i i don't like them right <laughs> so it's it's something that has to start really early really early and we honestly you know to be honest i've seen a lot of communities a lot of families moving toward that uh, selections you know is is not all of none you know I, I see a lot of people not only getting excellent education but really making a difference in terms of you know decisions about health care preventive care so i i think um, i have huge hope that we are doing strikes a little bit in some communities yeah i think martina when you you asked that question and just hearing uh dr mejia you kind of talk about sort of that education piece uh, i always kind of think about even like our education system right and the 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 change that needs to happen just in general with our education system, especially here in Chicago and, and sort of what we're teaching and, and what gets left out uh, as far as like history and, and those things. And I know this is not the, the episode <laughs> around that, but I think one of the things that, that I don't remember ever really kind of learning about is nutrition, right? Like, and, and, and knowing what's good, you know, what isn't like, and sort of that key thing as a kid to kind of understand the, the choices that you make when you eat and what it does to you and, and things like that. Like I, my health classes did not really focus on that. Like, I don't even remember really learning anything. And even just now I'm thinking like even through high school, there wasn't any sort of conversation around nutrition and, and what, you know, and the importance of it, right. The importance of the choices you make, like you mentioned, Dr. Mejia, it, it is sort of a personal choice, right. You choose what you're going to eat, but if, if I'm taught at an early age and it's reinforced through my environment, because maybe my parents were trying, right? They're like, you have to eat healthy. You have This is what I'm trying to teach you to eat. But if my environment, when I leave my home, doesn't reinforce that, as you said, like our school lunches, the breakfast that are offered, you know, meals that are offered in, in our communities and, and things like that, like if they don't reinforce that sort of nutritional value to food, then you know you're you're gonna get that easy access to the pizzas. There was a I remember in high school there was a cafeteria. The ca- there's two cafeterias in my high school. One of them had pizza every day for lunch, like <laughs> pizza and fries. Like that was one of the like, if you wanted pizza every day, and I'll be very vulnerable. I love pizza. So I was like, <laughs> but it was now that I look back, I was like there was a cafeteria like every day. Monday through Friday, you could get pizza and fries for lunch. And that was and that was it. And the other one, there was chicken sandwiches and then like cheese fries and all these things. And I think about like the reinforcement of it. And, you know, I don't know what the lunchroom looks like, you know, today, but I I, you know, from what I hear, it hasn't doesn't change a lot and there's still, but you know, that that piece of education, I I I think back of like how it wasn't there like my health classes didn't involve learning I mean I don't know Martina I don't know if your experience was any different I grew up in Mississippi so it's very <laughs> <laughs> look it's my home state I always love Mississippi but the education is subpar and the food you know I don't remember Lisette having two cafeterias we just had one cafeteria and I mean every day was something different but typically on Fridays we would have pizza or like hamburgers or something and throughout the week, honestly, I can't even remember what we had. But yeah, it was, I think, going back to the health class, I don't even remember us really touching on nutrition. I really, and, and if we did, we kind of glazed over it. Um, and once I got into high school and college, well, college, you know, you can take things that are specialized to what you want to major in. So, you know, but I do feel that and maybe this is just kind of where we are in history. Nowadays, kids, even though the food is probably still not great, 
there's so many more different food allergies and parents, you know, not wanting their kids to have sugar and things like that. However, those are, are usually within more affluent neighborhoods sometimes. And I know for black and brown communities, again, it comes back to what do you have access to and then, and, and then that education piece. So, you know, I'm really not too shocked to hear that this, I mean, unfortunately it's still something that kids are not being able to have a nutritional balanced meal in school. Uh, and then also just the health factor in it. I mean, I definitely agree that education is a big one, but after we get out of that education, going back to what you said, you know, the set, how do you, how do you continue implementing? How do you continue going forward with that? If you're not seeing it every day. So what I, I'm going to share with you a, a clinical observation. This, this is really, you know, interesting. So when I see diabetics, you know, I, you know, I have many of my patients when they retire, you know, usually with, you know, with passing the years, they, be, they become citizens or residents, they can stay, um, but they, they continue being extremely close to their families in Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, or any country. So usually um, in, in during the winter, they go there. They're like, you know, migratory birds, right? So they, they, they go back and they spend the winter in, you know, in the, in the countries. So initially, I remember with my diabetes having this conversation and I saying, you know, just be careful when you go there because, you know, family would like to treat you and you're going to be eating your homemade tortillas and it's going to be fun and delicious. Careful with your diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. And then I started seeing this interesting phenomenon. People will return from Mexico, again, okay, Guatemala or any country, and then the A1C was lower meaning better diabetes control, and they lost weight. And I said, what happened? I said, I'm sorry I ate so much. I said, no, actually, you lost weight. <laughs> so it's, it's when, when, you know, and I saw this frequently, and I continue seeing it, right? I, I've been watching this, this phenomenon for many years, and you can see, and again, it's a very observational, right? But, you know, you see it in your practice, right? People eat better where the food industry is not so spread and available, you know, every every block, right? Or, you know, is I mean, it's you eat what you cook, right? And the, the ingredients and everything, exactly. So That's it's it. more natural. And people come here and, you know, or I remember having people, uh, many of my patients who, who came from, for example, from, for example, from Cuba, right? where really food is scanty. I mean, they, 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 the rates of obesity in Cuba are very low and for different social reasons, access to food is very limited and difficult. But once they arrive here, it's, it takes just a few months for people to really become overweight and quickly obese. So that, that's, you know, it's, it's the quality. The quality is a huge factor. So again, and it's a difficult competition. I mean, it's, it's a difficult, I mean, moms and parents in general are competing with the food industry, right? Mm -hmm. How can you tell a, you know, three-year-old guy right, that, you know, has to eat broccoli, you know, uh, in, or not a, a burger, right? It's a difficult fight. It's not easy, right? Um, but, you know, I think, I think that's the source of many, many health inequities too, is, is having the huge penetration of the food industry in our communities. Um, the massive, you know, and they have clear goals. I mean, they want people really not to cook. They want people to just continue consuming yeah. this. Uh, and that, 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 I think that's so sad because it's, it's a huge, huge manipulation, I think, for our communities. And, you know, I think that's so interesting that you touched on that because, you know, I think it's a nice transition really to talk about how capitalism in a way plays a huge part in this and to hear you say you know that it is sad that this is how in many in, in many industries but especially the food industry where you know we have this kind of double-edged sword here in America and it's like we want people to be healthy but still we allow different fast food industries to be on every corner 
um, and we don't have adequate fruit stands or produce stands or adequate grocery stores within those neighborhoods. And so it's just really, to me, kind of want to dig a little deeper, uh, Dr. Mejia, and see how do you think or do you think that capitalism kind of exacerbates the overall food industry as it connects to, to healthcare? And would you see like the role, cause I know you are very active within the community. Um, would you see a bigger role that maybe healthcare should play in the role of like working with the industry and food industry? Because it is, it's such, it's such a big money maker. And it's like, but you know, we have people, especially black and brown who have heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol and high blood pressure. Um, and yeah, I'm just interested in hearing your feedback about that. And let's say you as well, jump in, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, so opportunities, job opportunities, income, right? Now that Illinois, which I, you know, I, I love the way Illinois, Illinois has many, many virtues and many problems, right? But one area that I, I really appreciate is being one of the leaders in the country in minimum wage. I think that's that's very progressive. I really appreciate that, right? Because really our communities require need, you know, uh, I mean, I have many patients who have two and even three jobs. So really people are here in the business of surviving, right? Yeah. When you have to feed your family, right. pay your rent, you know, if you live in the border, in the suburbs, you need a car, right? With all the expenses that come along with the car. So surviving here, living, the minimum living is, is tough, right? It's really difficult. You know, when, when and that's, that was my shocking experience when I came here because I never imagined that that existed, right? Um, I remember when in our company, well, after the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid was expanded and we, 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 we pen, start pen, penetrating the suburbs, right? And we went to North suburbs and West suburbs thinking that it was going to be difficult to find patients, right? And suddenly we saw a massive population coming to look for healthcare. And, you know, I mentioned before, people who, who most recently visited the doctor was the pediatrician and the young adult trial. So I think, I think that's, that's a huge, one, one of the elements that people sometimes don't understand well, you know, because you really need to be close to the immigrant population to understand this, right? Mm -hmm. So there are different phenomena that happen. The difference between a job when you know English, at least a minimum amount to interact, right? For example, if you, if you, a, a good job for an immigrant is to be a driver, right? You can drive, you know, a semi truck, you can drive a taxi, you can drive the Uber. You need a basic, basic you know, uh, skills in English basic right to really being able to survive to survive the system otherwise you can so you can see when people arrive here the big difference before and after they acquire some english right some english skills that can make a difference huge difference in per hour that can be the difference between having to have one or two jobs mm -hmm. so not easy no now people don't have this the the social support that they have in in their countries like in, in our communities in, in, in Latin America, families support each other, right? So you, you're never alone. You have your aunts, you have your uncle, you have your grandma, grandpa, you have everybody wants works together and everybody supports. Here is difficult for, for many women, it's difficult to work because I mean, you know, childcare is extremely expensive, difficult, right? Um, moms decide to stay home. So that has to take two or three jobs in order to make the living. So again, uh, agree, capital is for sure, you know, it's because the cost of living here is ridiculously high, right? Surviving so here is extremely expensive, expensive, especially when your income is low, you know, um, it's, it's very difficult. It, and you have, a, we have an immense population in that category in Chicago, like millions. So it's, 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 it will continue being a challenge, you know. Um, let's not even not even going to the to the field of the undocumented people who really are working in a marginalized way, right? Yeah. Doing very very blue collar jobs, 
you know, um, that, you know, working in the shadows, right? Um, being paid, you know, cash. Um, we have, a, I mean, yeah, I can tell you how many, right? That is not a secret, right? So that's huge determinant. That, I mean, for a person in that situation, help get is the fifth or sixth priority, right? It's, I mean, no, I mean, this is not important for you. Important part is making sure you make the money so you don't end homeless, right? So again, those are factors that I have no doubt that are huge, huge, you know, uh, influences for for the for the social inequity and health inequity. Yeah, Martina, when you brought up and as Dr. Mejia was kind of talking about sort of the the impact that capitalism has on on healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in general or we're talking about a, a specific. Uh, community or population I think it, it's yeah it, it takes so much right because you know healthcare whether it's the insurance industry whether it's the fast food industry or just the food industry in general like everything is about making that dollar and getting more and more of that dollar and you start seeing people as dollar signs and not as humans uh, who deserve like you you mentioned a, a living wage and that mm -hmm you know, changes depending on where you're at, right? Like mm -hmm. a living wage here in Chicago is not the same as a living wage in maybe New York or LA, you know, in, in, in or in a small town in, you know, Oklahoma or something, right? And I think it's important to take all those things into consideration and, and, and what role does, do these industry play in ensuring that people have access to those things through having a living wage through having access to to health insurance right because I think you know I I think about uh, as you mentioned you know Dr. McKenna the population who who's in the shadows right those that are for the most part undocumented who who don't have access to health care uh, who don't have access to insurance who don't have access to you know those things and and although, you know, we have, you know, clinics who, you know, you can pay on a sliding scale and, you know, you do have free and charitable clinics, but there's so far few in between of those. And sometimes they have wait lists, you know, you they can't see you right away. And if, mm -hmm. you know, with a free and charitable clinic and things like that. So it, it, it is, I think, you know, Martin, when you think about capitalism, when you think about sort of the way that the United States society is structured, um, it is about that dollar and it is about getting more and more. And when you start, when you have that mentality and you see these large industries and companies who only see their people as either people that can get them more money, right? Or people who are, you know, they're just dollar signs, right? Like, you know, you know, I, I know we're talking about healthcare and Dr. Mejia, you're in the healthcare industry, you know, and like what role... You know, and we're talking about capitalism, we're talking about it, like what role and, and how do we fix this? I mean, there's conversations about universal health care. You know, is that something that will bring that equity into light for all of us? You know, where people have access to health care and you don't have to worry about do you have the best health insurance, you know, or do you have a really bad one that's going to cover very little things and everything else is out of pocket? You know, like, I don't know, like, is that how we achieve health equity in a sense or in a step in the right direction? Is it universal health care? Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, Dr. Mejia, you as a physician, as someone who's in there, is that an answer? I don't know mm -hmm. if you have thoughts around that. Well, I, I think if you don't have access to, to health care, that's, that's the initial big problem, right? Because that would take us back to the 19th century, really. Having basic access to care. And for many families, the only interaction with the doctor is when there is an emergency. Mm -hmm. And that's bad, right? You have a problem, you have to go to the ER, but you don't have a primary care doctor or any kind of provider. If you don't have that access to the basic things, you know, obviously your life expectancy is going to be shorter, right? Um, and this, this, is, this is actually, you know, really sad, you know, not having been able to really uh, do preventive, you know, colon cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, getting immunizations, right? So it's a lot of injustice, injustice over there. But, you know, when I think about jobs, you know, and 
been seen you know, for many years, you know, the underserved populations, there are some areas that really are even crossing the line of basic human rights, right? Yeah. When I see how people are treated in some factories, line workers, like for example, I mean, that that is crossing the borders of, you know, legal borders, quite frankly. Yeah, people who yeah. work in, recyc in the recycling industry. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, patients who work, you know, recycling and um, metal or, you know, cardboard or stuff like that. The, the, the working condition of these people is, is absolutely cruel, you know, and, and very difficult. Even in the, in the landscape arena, right? Um, there's a lot of people working, you know, in, in conditions that they have, they have no safety net, no, not only no, not only no health care, but no benefits of any kind, working extremely, you know, crazily amount of hours every week. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, when you need your job, you just continue, you keep going, right? You don't complain because you lose your job and you have, you apparently, you know, people know, don't know that they have rights, you know? And, and again, again, education, again, right? Like, for example, I've seen so much abuse, you know, for from employers, uh, so I always tell my patients, do you know that, you know, working rights as a worker, your rights are not influenced by any other things like immigration, those different things. People don't know this. They are scared, right? Um, when you see, for example, you know, recently after the pandemic, Illinois provided, and it's, Illinois is one of the, you know, ahead of the game, right? Providing care for seniors 50 years and above mm -hmm. who are well, not seniors, 50 and above who are undocumented, they are eligible for Medicaid. So, but people are so scared, right? So mm -hmm. scared, right? They don't even use the benefits. They don't because they are scared, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's complex. It's very complex. Um, the, it's a huge damage that has been historical for decades, right? Living that circle that, you know, uh, situation is, is difficult. Same thing for some communities that are that are technically isolated, right? When you see the the, the areas in Chicago, when it's very difficult for a young men young women to make you know the jump and you know get the education they need and change right the the, the living conditions. It, I mean, you need to be equipped with a lot of you know resources and support and motivation, right? Motivation to do that. So it's, again, it's, it's complex, you know, and people can be judgmental and say, oh, yeah, no, it is because, you know, but no, it's, it's, it's sometimes almost impossible to leave this circle of poverty, lack of, lack of opportunities, discrimination. Sometimes it's almost, you know, impossible to, to survive those, yeah. I have a follow-up in where, where do you think, Dr. Mejia, that to get us on uh, the right track, and what is like your top, well, I wanna say like your top things that we need to do in terms of just equity in, in healthcare. I know you mentioned education, but what else needs to happen? Cause you also touched on um, motivation. Right. And so that's one I had not always heard about. People, people do need to be motivated, but what are your thoughts on how do we get to equity in, in healthcare? So again, not a politician, not a public health person, but this is this is how how we see it from the healthcare industry perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So we move from a model of care that is reactive to the disease, which is a model you know content to for failure, right? When you just react, when you're sick, you get treatment. Um, that model is absolutely you know useless in terms of outcomes. Then you, you, you move a little bit more to a preventive model where the individual is brought, you know, to get health care and do some preventive measures, uh, close on quality gaps, you know, vaccinations, colons, cancer screening, breast cancer screening, all the things, cervical cancer screenings, everything in terms of prevention. But you continue working with the individual, with the person. That is good, but not enough because you still have this inequity where nobody has the same access, right? So... I think the future where really uh, we need to move forward is to the, the concept of population health, which is 
more is beyond the one person. It's not one person. It works with the person, but integrated in the community. So when you talk about pop health, you need to take in account all the determinants of health for that person. For example, you know, in the community, job opportunities, safety, access to food, education, transportation, all kinds of things, you know, that you can start working on. And it's not, it's not the it's not the function of the healthcare organizations, it's everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's you know, people who are in politics, you know, people who are leaders, uh, organizations, faith organizations, it's everyone making sure that that community offers, you know, what people need, right? Um, I think that that will be the next, you know, uh, itinerary if we can really do any impact in, in inequities. It's not working, in, it's no longer working with one, one person at a time, it's working with the community in the concept, under the concept of population health. I think, you know, that requires a lot of, requires a lot of investment, um, data, analytics, you know, uh, education, compromise, resources, but it's, it's, it's not one individual, one person at a time, it's one community at a time, right? Because think, think about it, you know, the dead gap is about communities. When we, we talk about the dead gap that is 30 years, right? You can see it's, it's the communities, right? It's not one person living in the Gold Coast, or one person living in Austin. Mm -hmm. It's the community of Austin and the community, you know, in in whatever the neighborhood is in the, in the area of the lake. So it's, it is it is working to create an environment where people can, you know, have all the capacities, function well, you know, grow a family, you know, age well, right, healthy, have a joyful life with equity, with the basic needs satisfied, right, with opportunities to handle mental health, right? Mental health is a huge determinant, you know. I don't know if you're aware, but, you know, homelessness is linked really directly, almost directly to mental health. Yeah. It's not about, you know, some substance use disorder. No, it's, it's, which is part of mental health, but in general, it's mental health, right? Mm -hmm. The main determinant for homelessness. So, you know, it's, it's that kind of, you know, trying to modify all those determinants into the communities. I think that's, that's, that's the way. Definitely. I've been hogging questions, Lisette, so I think I've asked no, you. No, I, I don't even have a question. I think I have a, a thought process. Uh, uh, and you that know me know that I process things as I'm listening. And I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but one of the things, you know, when you're talking, Dr. Mejia, about sort of it takes a community and it takes sort of addressing uh, the community as a whole and, and what does that environment look like and what does those access look like? I, th I think about the barriers, right? I think about, you know, what what needs to change to remove those barriers? Like you think about policies that have to come through and then and and sort of systems changes that need to happen you know I think uh I work a lot in sort of that aspect of public health and and, and what that can look like and um I think about just recently you know my my dad had to go to a follow-up appointment with a with a doctor um, and he got there and they were like oh we can't see you until you pay this balance that you're that you have to, that, that's due and my sister was the one that took over. She's like, she texted me. She's like, I'm just gonna have to pay. And was like, I have to pay. And I was like, well, I'll go half, you know, I'll pay half of it and you pay the other half. But they wouldn't see him. They were like, unless you, and my sister was like, you know, the doctor was so upset, but he couldn't do anything about it. Cause that's just the system, right? Like, that's just how it is. Uh, and I was like, but I think about like, okay, imagine, and it was a balance from like, 2013 2014 that we hadn't even known about that we didn't even realize was there and it was just this thing of like you got to pay this amount or we won't see you and I was like is that what our health care is like is that what taking care of a person means like I won't see you unless you pay this and you know and my sister relays like you know, it wasn't the doctor it was just the system and the doctor was like he wants to help my dad right like and and do this and I think about those barriers of what you know, insurance and, and the cost of it and, and how, if you don't have the right insurance, 
you're gonna end up paying more and, and it's become this whole thing where we had to get my dad like supplemental insurance and all these things so that he could get the care but you know and I think about what what are those barriers that need to change like you talked to me about like um you know making sure that people know their their workers rights right how does you know especially the, those those that are undocumented and, and have that fear of like going and seeking help like how do we get that word out there how do we ensure that preventative care is happening and everyone has access to that preventative care you know without having to fear that if you owe thirty dollars or fifty dollars or a hundred dollars like they're not gonna you know they're not gonna turn you away and you're gonna have to like come back when you can pay it off and that's like that was such a an eye-opening thing to hear from my sisters like are you kidding me like yeah. My dad can't get the care that he actually needs until you pay this bill. And one that we didn't even know it was years ago. You didn't know about it. And now they're like, oh, and now it was just that barrier. And I just think about those barriers and how do we work towards removing those? And how do we get to a, a point where people don't have to worry or being scared of the healthcare industry? I, I, I hear you and I feel, you know, I have exactly the same feelings. Let, let me tell you, um, indulge me with some personal views here, very personal. I feel compassion and sympathy for my colleagues who work in an environment where the solution for your pain or suffering is linked to money. I think that's, oh, you know, you, I personally, I can't do that, right? So it's like, your son has a medical condition, but if you don't have the media, the monetary means so we can take care of him. Mm -hmm. For me, that's very difficult. I, th that's something that I, as a professional, I can swallow. I, I can't, right? And I admire my colleagues that live in that system. I, I know, you know, it's, it's the extreme expression of capitalism health, right? Now, one of the things that I work where I work is because the access of healthcare, right? It's like, you know, um, this is a model of care. I'm referring to a, the community health centers, right? Community health centers, you know, have this, this advantage situation where number one, everyone, everyone has access, right? Mm -hmm. You will never be denied care, which is good, right? Now you, you are, you can argue, okay, it's the same for the ERs. And yeah, that's true. I have a patient last week who, you know, he was shoveling snow, he was cleaning snow, he fell down and broke his arm. Mm. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, but so he went to a hospital, private hospital. He was seen, right? Uh, they put a cast um, and they said, yeah, perfect. Uh, but he, no insurance, obviously. obviously. Um, and they said, you need a follow-up. And really, he needs a follow-up to number one, making sure the, the, the bone is healing. And number two, in six, eight weeks to remove the cast. And they were very honest with you up front. Uh, you, know, you need to pay $500. We saw you in the emergency because it's the law, right? Uh, but then you have to pay $500. Now, $500, this patient doesn't make $500, <laughs> right? So, <Yeah. laughs> so then he comes to me. Um, you know, I had to look for a hospital, a safety net hospital. And, you know, I'm glad we have those two you know, organizations who can take. Otherwise, this poor man, you know, will be confronted to taking the gas by himself and pray to God that the fracture is going well because there is no way to do a follow-up. Mm -hmm. So my, my point is this, you know, having having this painful situation where you have a family member, imagine yourself in this position, your wife, you know, or your mom or anyone that you really love is suffering for something and can access healthcare because of monetary restrictions. That's absolutely, I, I can imagine a worst case scenario really. When, when you see the most advanced health systems in the world, right. they are systems with full access. Now they have problems, absolutely, but they are founded in a huge prevention, primary care and community interventions. Talking about Canada, talking about Denmark. So those health systems that are probably the best, right? are com extremely based on, you know, community, community interventions, family doctors, working and living within the communities. So well, that's a big, uh, another big difference. Now, 
obviously they are not perfect, but in general, you know, as a population, the outcomes are, are much, much better, right? So I, I know probably we won't see this change in many years here, but at least I think we can do our part, right? Um, working and trying to work with the communities that need it, you know, the most. But that's, that's a, a crude reality where you, where you picture Liz. That's, that's a very yeah. sad reality. Yeah, and it, it was one of those moments where as someone who is in the public health sphere, I was like, how, how, like, how do we, how do we continue in this system that takes humanity outside of, out of healthcare, right? Like that, that doesn't see, that only sees an individual as someone that's gonna, you know, put more money on somebody's pocket, you mm -hmm. know, versus I want to make sure that you are taken care of, that you get the best quality care. And I think that's a whole other thing, right? Like the quality of care should be across the board high for everyone, right? And you shouldn't have to compromise because you might live in a community that may not have the facilities that you need or the right, you know, specialists right there that, that you can access and, and things like that. And I think that that is a whole other thing that I've just seen over the last few months, just going through this with, you know, with my dad and, and, and seeing it and, and living through it as someone who has, you know, pretty good health insurance and I know what I can access, mm -hmm. but, you know, having to be an advocate like that is so hard having to be an advocate having to you know read through all of the the paperwork and and all these things and you know fortunate that you know I have siblings that can help me and, and help our you know our parents navigate that but I think of people who who don't have that support yeah. system around yeah. them who can't find the right you know a, a way to help them out they can fill out the paper when they're like well we you, we can help you can fill out this paperwork and we can you know help, maybe help your, your dad out but you're asking for like so many you know documents and all these things and all this information that it's like I, you're like I'd rather not like I don't want to go through all that <laughs> All right. Just for the end, for you to tell me, oh, we can't, it's denied. You, we can't, you know, you're not going to get the help. But it's like, I, you made me go through all this. So I think it, it's just one of those things where I think about the understanding of what that process is for for a patient, you know, what that insurance process is. Because uh, a lot of the times what I've realized, particularly with this experience, is sometimes the physicians as they're trying to help may not understand that their insurance isn't going to cover what you're, what you're doing to help your patient, you know, and you're, you know, the, the, the patient's left with a thousand dollars, you know, and, and, you know, the physician was just doing what they thought they were they needed to do or helping. And, you know, I was like, there's that a little bit of that disconnect, even within, you know, those that are in healthcare to really understand what what it is for for a patient to to deal with that but yeah it's been it's been a roller coaster with with just healthcare in general the last few months but but yeah like i don't know martina i don't know if you if felt like you wanted to say something dr he gave me a little hope when you were talking about denmark and canada and you were like it's gonna take a while to get there and what i got from that is that you believe that we're gonna get there you think we are gonna get to that and so it gave me some hope. I'm like, okay, we perhaps we can get get there. And I was like, to hear it come out of your mouth, I was like, okay, one day, one day. I think that we don't, we don't have any options. The system is so so broke. Um, is, yeah. We don't have no options. You know, in few years, you know, money won't be enough to afford this aging population, right? Mm -hmm. We are this this population is aging quickly. Um, so, you know. When you talk about quality, I really want to refer about quality. And this is what, how I see the situation. I think when you deal with underserved populations, quality is more important than you, when you are working with people with private insurance or more financially stable conditions. And there's a simple reason, number, or a couple of reasons. Number one, because you're more vulnerable, right? You know, I don't, I don't see any of my patients doing a gel review for a doctor or a, you know, Google review. They don't even know how to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they don't even handle a computer many times. So 
many of my patients don't have the skills to to demand good care, right? Whereas, you know, in the private sector, even a little, little situation can trigger a complaint. And that's the, the right thing to do. People have the right to complain about a bad service, poor service, and that's perfectly fine. But, you know, when you are in the in, in the business of surviving, you don't have, first of all, you don't have the time to, to do that. Or many times you don't have to know the skills, you know. But the other reason why you why you deserve, you have to provide the best quality of care is, is because, you know, when you are really underserved and you depend on a free clinic of a community health center or a safety net hospital, you don't have more options. That's your option. That's right? it. That's, That's it. I mean, we have in our company, we have uh, where I work, we have areas where our health centers is the only resource in the area mm-hmm. for people with no insurance or people with Medicaid. There is nothing else. So that's why we are mandated, you know, obligated to provide the best care. Doing less wouldn't be completely unacceptable, right? It's, yeah. it's, I mean, we have no option to, pro- to provide the best, the best possible care, right? Because you, when people don't have options, when you have different options, you have a good insurance, you can go to the website and, you know, check the reviews. It's like doing, you know, uh, check the, the, the comments and, choose the provider that, you know, fits you. Well, for many people, that's not real. Yeah. That's not real. So uh, that's why, you know, and <clears throat> one of the areas, uh, again, going back, I'm passionate about, you know, people who, who I work with is, you know, I work with more than 200 providers, all of kind, you know. Um, you know what, let me tell you, these people make less money working with us that they will be probably making working outside in the private sector. Mm-hmm. However, it's the passion and the motivation to work with these communities. For me, I mean, that humbles me really to, to see this huge group of, group of talented people, very talented, highly educated people, just devoted to, you know, to work hard. And as the, you know, so add this bullet point to your list of hope, Martina. Because we have good providers, we have excellent epidemiologists, we have excellent data analysts, we have people working in public health that are, are phenomenal, you know, and are trying to make the change. And I think the make is changing and it will happen. When you see, for example, let me give you an example, Medicaid in Illinois. Well, Medicaid in Illinois is migrating completely out of the fee-for-service model. Because the fee-for-service we go back to the same recipe, right? You come, is one interaction. You come because you have tonsillitis. I treat your tonsillitis and that's it. I don't do anything else, right? I just treat your tonsillitis. If you need something else, you have to come back, right? Because it's another visit. Fee for service, one visit, one payment. When you migrate to move to value-based service, the outcome is not the visit. The outcome is the health outcome for that person. That's the difference, right? So, you know, when, when you have a Medicaid system program in the state that is moving toward that, that for me is, is hope. It's hope. Because now it's not gonna it's not gonna be seen, you know, the patient as many times as I can as, as I can so I can build more. No, it's, it's seeing this patient once or twice a year, but in a in a meaningful interaction that will address social determinants of health, right? Mental health, you know, job situation, financial status, you know, uh, screenings, uh, prevention. So it's going to be a more holistic care oriented on on quality. So for me, that's another uh, bullet point to be optimistic. I'm I'm optimistic, right? I'm optimistic. And I think, you know, every actor, every actor, for example, what we are doing now here, right? I think, you know, in the future, I mean, some people will listen and resonate. Okay, or probably it's going to be an eye-opener for people saying, wait a minute, I didn't know this, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that was the situation, right? So I think all of us can do something, right? Everyone can put a little bit to to improve. And and we don't don't need to wait for Washington to resolve our situations. We surely can do something in our respective roles. That's what I think. I'm optimistic. 
it really touched my heart to hear you say 200 physicians um, yeah. because you, you, we don't, you know, that's what we don't always see in the news and in the articles you see the physicians and, and the medical professionals. I mean, I think probably, probably since COVID, we've seen a little bit more, gotten a little bit more into that world, but you don't often see all the different people that are making a difference every day by doing what you're just talking about. So that really touched me. I, I really, it's just, you know, and we do need more people like that. And I think too, folks have to realize that this didn't happen overnight it's gonna take a while. You know, that's always a thing, you know, we, it's gonna take a while to get, to get all the good stuff that we want. Um, so yeah, that was, that was just very touching. I just to hear that. I appreciate your coming. I appreciate your coming. You know, we feel a lot of respect and I don't mention the company I work for because here I'm just speaking as high to me here, but mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we, we, we started a few years ago was a practice transformation. So in the future, when you used to come to our health centers, you have to wait for two hours to be seen, right? So people used to bring a lunch and a book, sit down for two or three hours to be seen. That was, that was pathetic. So we went through this practice transformation and what happens now is people, you know, are seen quickly. And that's part of the equi equ equation because this is an extended hours. Because this is the thing, you know, when you work, let's say you're working in a fast food restaurant, right? You're paid by the hour, right? You can't just stay the whole day, right? Because it's gonna affect your income seriously, right? Even if you have insurance. So, you know, having a system that is efficient, that, yeah, for example, now offers telehealth visits, right? So, and we are not the only ones doing this, of course. Many people are doing the same and there are excellent programs around the city. But this is, this is the positive aspects that I'm seeing now. Incorporating technology, right? So not only if systems are becoming more efficient, but, you know, people can really use a mobile device to communicate with the provider, right? Or to check the results or to make an appointment. Uh, remember, people may don't have a, a computer, but more than 90% of the population in the United States has a mobile device, 90%. So mobile devices are all over the world. I mean, the access to a mobile device is compared with PCs or laptops is huge, right? Mm -hmm. So, but those are the things that may give, give me kind of hope that we are moving in, in the right direction, right? We are, we are making some, some little baby steps to really get to those communities and provide what they need, you know, and, you know, cultivate more equity. I, I, I'm positive, optimistic. So great to hear. And I think I love the positive sort of ending that we're getting to sort of this optimism that you brought, Dr. Mejia, it's sort of how we can get there, right? We can get to a point where there will be health equity across the board. And and you mentioned it's going to take sort of this ground level, grassroots kind of, we all can do something, you know, while, you know, our governments to be have to do what they have to do to make it across the board but you know there are things that we can be doing simultaneously um because it has to i i'm a firm believer that it has to be from the top and the bottom and, and somehow we meet at the middle uh you know and, and and make it all work um to do that so i think it's it's just great and, and to kind of hear sort of you talk about sort of the the health center that you, that you are a part of and, and what you all are doing and fortunate enough to hear from other, you know, community health centers uh, across the area too, who, and I met great people who really care, yeah. who, who who say things awesome. like, we want, we want to do better. We want to make a change. We want to make sure that all of our patients are receiving the care and that preventative care. I think everyone that I've probably spoken to has brought up to attention, like preventative care is key, is the thing to ensure that we aren't getting to a point where you know you're it's not disease driven it's sort of like here's what we're doing to prevent it you know like right now everything is we'll see you and we'll treat the disease and we'll try but it's it's gotten to a point where it's going to cost more yeah. to treat the disease than it is if we could have prevented this you know five years ago even a year ago things could have been done you know differently and i think um, we don't see it. And, and if I go back and connect where we started, 
this conversation with the food industry and, and sort of that disease driven state that we're kind of in, you know, that all is connected, right? Like that is part of the problem and how we get there. But I love hearing sort of just the optimism that you have brought uh, Dr. Mejia to, to this conversation that, you know, it is possible. It's not going to be tomorrow. Uh, and it might not be, you know, but, you know, as long as I think it, but as long as there's people like you, Dr. Mejia and others that are willing to sort of do the work and, and, and be in the trenches, you know, of it all and, and, and really kind of helping our communities. I think it, it, it is possible, I think. Um, but I, I think we're kind of at, at a nice place to close You out. know, I, I thought we were talking just for 20 minutes and I realized that we've been speaking for more than an hour. Yeah. I'm t- it goes by. So careful, with, careful with inviting me again because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can talk no stop. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you for this great opportunity. I, I have enjoyed, you know, talking to you with you. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Great discussion. Really. It has. And uh, we will have you back one day. <laughs> we will definitely have you back. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, thank you so much, Dr. Mejia. This has just been, uh, this has been great to just have this conversation. I think I can speak for both me and Lisa. I mean, we've learned even more about you. We already knew you were an amazing person. Uh, but just to me, you know, even even in the previous video, hearing hearing about your upbringing back home and how you've transitioned here and you get, you know, I, I got this from you when I first met you, just a genuineness about you and it really comes through. And so I'm hoping that our listeners and our reviewers, they get that same energy from you, that you are just a genuine person. What you see is what you get. Um, and that, you know, it seems like you really do have, have a heart of gold. So thank you. For- I have enjoyed this. Uh, it's my first podcast. I never done a podcast before. I've done TV, radio, interviews, you know, town halls, panels, <laughs> but never a podcast. And I like the, the, it's a fresh format, you know, and, you know, just for the record, we never prep anything, you know, no prep, no content, nothing. It was just just uh-huh. the conversation. We never prep any questions. And I love that, right? I love that because that can, can bring our spontaneous feelings and, and opinions. And, and I think that's very positive. Again, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I think with that note, you know, thank you, Dr. Mejia. I love that you, you said it is a conversation. We have worked hard to ensure that this platform is a conversation starter, a conversation generator, and just allow the for all of us to just share what we generally want to share. So thank you for that. Uh, and, and to our listeners, thank you for joining us, for tuning in. Uh, we will, you know, be back with uh, more episodes around this healthcare in America. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can DM us. There, you can either go to our Facebook page or Instagram. Uh, and we, we will be happy to kind of hear what, what you all have to say. Uh, and, and thank you. And we will be back soon. Thank right, you. Bye, everyone. Everyone. Take care.